Today the NRM marks 30 years of having been in power. Have they delivered the fundamental change they did promise to Ugandans 30 years ago? On Newsnight, I speak to Lieutenant General Henry Tumukunde, who is the former Director General of the Internal Security Organization. General Tumukunde, thanks for joining me for this interview. My pleasure, sir. You participated in uh, the Bush war that brought President Museveni to power. You joined in 1981. And uh, on the day that he took power, he said, this is not a mere change of guard. This is a fundamental change. Would you say that 30 years later, the fundamental change that you and him and the others promised to Ugandans has been delivered? Well, sometimes uh, it depends on what you call fundamental change. What did you call fundamental call, change then? What we called fundamental change was transforming Uganda's economy, transforming Uganda's security, transforming Uganda's rights, especially as you now can must uh, agree with us, rights of women, rights of children, a number of those that were almost absolutely lacking at that time. For us, that's fundamental change. We have an economy, and what shapes an economy? It is infrastructure. It is capacity to allow people to invest without any fear. It's all here. In his inaugural address, uh, President Yuri Museveni, and I'll quote, he said, the problems, of, the problems of Africa and Uganda in particular are caused by leaders who overstay in power, which breeds impunity, corruption, and promotes patronage. Do you think President Museveni has been in power longer than is necessary? Why leaders stay in power is a matter of the party they lead. The party decides succession issues. The party decides who comes in and who leaves. The party arranges competition between leaders if they want to offer new leadership. So it's larger about the party. I don't know what President Museveni had in mind at that time, but as far as I'm concerned, party, party decides the rules. Party decides. In 2003, at a retreat, you came out and vehemently disagreed with the impending change of the constitution to remove term limits, and later on in 2005 at a radio talk show, you came out critically and castigated that, and uh, later you fell out with the system. What has changed now? Well, the rules of democracy are very clear and categorical. You put up a fight against a certain position. Should this fight not be supported by the majority, you join the majority. You already say so much about uh, democracy, democracy. The rules are written and are not yesterday rules. I lost a fight, so you join the majority. So you do not say, would you say that what you said then, you rescind it, you are apologetic about it? I was simply defeated by numbers. The rules of democracy are very... We are going for an election. If you lose an election by two votes, you are defeated, said and done. Talking of elections, uh, some have called you President Museveni's troubleshooter. Candidate Mabazi has accused you severally of going ahead of him in Kamarole district. You flew a chopper there, distributed campaign materials for President Yor Museveni and all. He has said you've been given millions of shillings to, in many ways, jeopardize his candidature. What's your role in this election? I don't know if I have a role, but I support President Museveni as the candidate of this period and time. I'm certainly NRM, or call it mainstream if you want. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm given roles to play as a party member. I left the army. Therefore, I stand a right to campaign for a candidate I so prefer. About being troubleshooter, I know how our language is sometimes used by people in the way they prefer. I wish I knew what you mean. If it is in the exact sense that I, I understand, I don't think I qualify to be called a troubleshooter. I have not gone ahead of Mbawaz during his campaigns. I think it's all about creating reason for why things don't work in a certain direction. Have you had me anywhere? Were you not in Kabarole? I was in Kabarole. What you were see, you this there? Kabarole story, mm. we need to... Everyone has a right to move. And to move even in particulars. 
and the means available for movement in this particular case, a helicopter, mm. is one among other forms of means, isn't it? Maybe the real issue that raised really is that the he went to a rally venue for yeah. candidate Mbabaz. He was meant to be there, and you but knew that. But there are written rules. There. Candidate Mbabaz was supposed to be in Guru that day, and it was 10 o'clock. I don't think there was. And you should understand that helicopters are guided by radars and the rules of flying, uh, flying and landing, especially considering that uh, helicopters are more difficult to land than an ordinary plane. Yes, plane mm -hmm. yes, planes, no, have got, planes have got, uh, you know, airstrips or airfield. A helicopter must find a place, for example, and that bomber ground. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Honore Wombaz has landed there very many times. Was it because you was trying to interfere with the rally? Yes or no, General? Did you know that Honorable Mumbabazi was going to hold a rally there? Nothing of that sort, because for us we read on the timetable of the election. Let's move on. In any case, it was 10 o'clock anyway. I don't think there was any big rally to talk about. You should, do, you newsmen, should look at these screens which you bring on. The, I mean, these uh, uh, pictures you bring on the screens. How many people were there anyway? to amount to disrupting a, a rally. 10 o'clock. The rally was supposed to be eight, 2 o'clock, I'm told. It's just because we don't have as much space to defend ourselves. But as far as I'm concerned, there was nothing offensive. You've talked about the army and politics. There's been a nexus between the army and politics um, before and even during this time. You have, for example, been an army representative in this mm -hmm. particular regime. Mm -hmm. Do you not feel it's a recipe for disaster when the army continuously continues to be a part of our politics? How are we in the politics? First of all, anyway, let me first lay out the history you must swear or know. We did not go to the bush because we are seeking career. So if some of us leave the army and choose to go the political course, we shouldn't be misunderstood. And in any case, how many army officers have been participating in politics? There are very few. Said and done, look at the whole picture of competence. What one does, the profession, for example, I see you as a possible presidential candidate. Who wants to screen you? I take that as a compliment. Yes, take it with <laughs> pleasure. Who would want to actually throw you out of competing for presidency just because you are a journalist? Are you sure that's fair? Do you not feel the army still has a stronghold on the politics not of this country? Not at all. In all not honesty? at all. How? How? Because the uh, uh, Colonel of SJ and the General Munt are standing. These guys were originally politicians. And that's what drove them to the bush. I don't think... We only came here and we are given a responsibility in the revolution to build the army because the army ensured stability. It had nothing to condemn us to eternity in, in, in serving the military. General, and in any case, the rules operate. When you want to stand for president, you resign from the army. Like any other person, I don't see anything wrong with that. In any case, as you will admit, I'm told in the last debate, which is so much uh, hyped. I'm told one of the military officers fared very well. Do you want to deny Uganda good leaders and good ideas and good minds just because of their profession? Are you going to join those who are already saying people must come from a certain uh, region? Do you know where you know Obama, you do you know where Obama comes from? Obama is Kenyan, isn't mm. he doing very well as a, a president of the United States? Granted, General, but when you hear people out there say that, look, if it is to oust President Museveni, we need, you know, an army officer, and you keep hearing people say, wait a minute, if a civilian takes over, will the army salute him? That talk is out there. Why Does it not? not worry you, or do you Why dismiss it as not? mere talk? Why not? How many civilians do we salute? Perpetual and permanent actually up to today. From the time I was a junior officer up to today, I'm saluting politicians. Are you sure that's a minute? Isn't that saluting enough? So I don't see why all this is worrying Ugandans. Stick to competence. Philosophical competence, ideological competence, capacity to understand the issues, capacity to run this economy, which is uh, quite uh, a nightmare in our circumstances. For me, that's what I would look for, and understanding the need of Ugandans. And what is all about politics? All about politics is 
you offer yourself for leadership, you have a good party, you win elections, you return services to the people. That's what should guide us. Issues about religion and how light colored you are and whether I look like a Somali, all these are just prejudicial as far as I'm concerned. Prejudicial you call them and one that has really raised one too many eyebrows is uh, looking at this election for example. Mm -hmm. Three of the leading contenders are all from Western Uganda. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is by design that those that take this seat or those that want to take this seat or are the front runners are seemingly a cabal from one region. You have is said it, before it, that uh, yes. it is the time you know that uh, other regions yes, take power. I stick to that point. Is it for lack of competence? Do you want to tell me Oral Tun shouldn't have pursued his presidential ambitions? Would you want to say Mao is not competent enough to be a president? Don't you know some other critical good minds that do not choose to offer themselves for presidents? You know I have raised that before. Good leaders like Mpang, competent brains, why don't they offer themselves for leadership? And where you don't offer yourself, I don't think we should spend a lot of time, you know, screening those who offer themselves. Do you How many competent Ugandans do you know? I know a one Rutara in northern Uganda, he prefers to do agriculture. Don't you think he could do I wish you knew him. There are many people I know. But you offer yourself. No one is going to hide you into leadership tunnel. You offer yourself. Said and done, I wouldn't mind other countries and other regions. I mean, sorry, other regions and other groups really taking leadership in the next period. But will they pick you from your house? Offer yourself. For me, that's what I think. Our most competent people, she's doing a disservice to our country for our most competent people to choose not to offer themselves for politics. You can see what it is causing the United States. They will tell you that uh, it's probably because the ground is not leveled, it is tumultuous out there when you go and campaign against candidate Museveni and there are the likes of General Tumukunde that, you know, will campaign for him. They look scary in and of themselves. But even, all. Uh, even those who are offering themselves, who are general enough, colonel enough, military enough, are offering the same complaints. So where do we judge it left? Where do we judge it right? As far as I'm concerned, in any case, there is no way you are going to become a leader without pushing yourself into a very serious struggle. President Museven did the same. For those who are soft-hearted, who don't want to take it on as the rules require, what can we do? Who is scaring who anyway in these circumstances? This election is remaining with three weeks. What is scaring about it? Actually, I want to call this a very dull election. I'm sure you would want to agree with me. It's simply dull. And therefore, who is scaring who? I don't think my face is that scaring. In any case, I'm not on the front of the scare. You I'm were quite active, ready. General, at uh, you know the start of the campaign, the incidents you're talking about in Kabarole district and other areas where it is said you went surreptitiously and all. All of a sudden, you have dissipated. You have gone quiet. I don't know whether it's tactical that could it be that then you overestimated uh, candidate yeah. Mbabazi, for example, and now you feel maybe it's not a big deal? Let me that, take a chip. That, that could be to do with the information you have, <laughs> the methodology of searching for votes. And that is if I'm searching for votes. But if I could admit I am, the methodology does not have to be one form, one exact form, one form that you know. We still canvass for votes under the party. The party has a leadership. You must have seen now National Task Force has been ushered into motion. The Secretariat has been doing quite a lot, especially in their circumstances, considering that they really inherited a very difficult situation. I am impressed that they are pacing it this well. So it's about methodology. I'm not too sure like they say, freedom of speech does not mean shouting fire in the street. You don't have to go shouting. You can canvass for votes in many different ways. And as you canvass for votes, whether it's in the open or clandestinely, mm -hmm. your target seems to be candidate Mbabazi. Um, the guns seem to have shifted away from Colonel Dr. Kiza Besije, who people think has a following. Why is this man so much of a headache to you people? Do you underscore my capacity to <laughs> read where it, forms, it, it, it performs best? Why do you think I don't know who? 
who is performing better. Attention according to who. As far as I'm concerned, we've got our schedules. Every morning we sit and evaluate what work we have to do and why we have to do it. As for those who think we are targeting Honore Mbawazi, well, that could easily be over-amplifying the situation. The truth, sir, is that every day there is a fresh evaluation of the circumstances at play. That's the only way to win an election. You must always evaluate, time after time. And you pick targets. Picking targets <laughs> does not mean you, you, know, you choose where to go, you choose which region to go, having considered which of those areas require more work. You have a bachelor's in law and a master's in an oil-related field. Yes. In an interview that you gave to NTV on 29th September, I believe it was, you said that uh, now that you have retired, you will think about probably doing something oil-related or going into that field. Is it a thought you still have or has it become politics for you? Politics? <laughs> well, we shall serve where we deem ourselves most competent to serve, isn't it? But also, most importantly, I'm not too sure everybody will be a politician. It's like not everybody will be a president. I could also give you some hints. A consultancy with my combination of being a lawyer, being a security expert, I'm sure you agree with that, and being an oil and gas uh, knowledgeable person, combination of this will give you a hundred consultancies where they are building pipelines, where all this is applicable. Now, going to all this, I'll choose where I think I saw best. Should uh, the country prefer to, you know, tender me for other roles, I'll consider them. As you know very well, I always consider issues, and I don't rush in situations. Yes or no, General? Are you a card-holding member of the NRM? I am actually the one who started the NRM. That's not an answer to the question I asked. Yes. I'm telling you, perpetually, I've been a member of NRM. You know, it's very well said that for all the many years, I have never pretended to belong to any other party. This is because this is our party. We spent a lot of energies building it. The first the fundamentals, the theoreticals, the ideas, the ideological positions, who are largely responsible? Your party, some feel that it has clearly steered clear of the question of succession. And there is a worry that what happens if, God forbid, President Museveni is no more? There could be worry. But this party has survived a lot of bad weather, as you know very well. For example, the departure of a Secretary General, General six months to an election, tried on another party, it would collapse. So why are you worried about all these things? We are a party, we are a formidable party, we are sorry, we we'll sort out ourselves. You have said that you have perpetually been NRM, and I just of recent that you retired, that uh, somewhere in, in September, I believe it was, but you were in the army. Military before, officer. And, uh, you said that you were a member of the NRM. Could it be that there are several other people within the army that are members of the NRM? Military officers have got political positions. They don't confess them in public, but they vote, for example. They vote for a party. They Voting is different from being a card-holding member of a party general. Well, as far as I'm concerned... For a, jail, for an, a serving military The officer. difference is that there is no difference. Because card, card holding members have got one principal purpose. Well, they may not participate in the day to day activities of the party, but they end up voting anyway. How, how, what importance is card holding, you know, if I may ask? Ideological belonging is more important. At the start of the show, you did tell me about the fundamental change and the achievements you feel you have attained as a party. Mm. If you were to be honest, what would you think have been your failures as a party 30 years on? Failures? For example, being infiltrated for so long by a person whose interest was not necessarily the party interest. That's a failure. Fortunately, it wasn't that successful, but that's a failure. Let's broaden it and look at we Ugandans whom you have been serving for 30 years as mm -hmm. a party. 
Where do you think you have failed? Where we've failed? Well, I must tell you, we could have done better on uh, issues like, for example, simple things you think are simple issues of nutrition, greater care, nutrition especially for young children, greater care for the disabled, although we've done very well as far as I'm concerned, issues like greater rights for women, and now the most challenging thing, whereas we succeeded so well in educating our children, time has come that we must provide jobs for them. And provide jobs for them doesn't mean we are going to do it in government. You see, this is always the wrong concept. Not really. India, for example, sir, 90% of the Indian economy is run in simple ways. A factory in a garage, that's what we should start looking at. And then about employment, encourage infrastructure, which you've done very well, encourage investment, inevitably you have to have, you know, jobs. Finally, yeah. as we wrap this up, General, Yes. Uganda has not seen a smooth transition. Do you believe the NRM can bequeath that to this nation? Did the... Uh, transition uh, from one regime to another, from one president to another. Yes, one. we didn't see peace for 22 years. Time came and peace came. We've lived in peace for 30 years. I see people calling it peace for 10 years, well, that's philosophical, that's a, you know, idea. But the whole issue is that we've succeeded doing many other things. Why are you worried about succession? That's Shouldn't we be worried? We have not finished the, most transition. It should be the simplest. Is can it I, simple? Can I advise you on how to simplify it? Mm -hmm. Offer yourself for leadership. Start owning yourself. Let's get to have where to, where to pick from. Let's get to know better leaders. Let's get to know, especially at your age. The youth needs people who understand their values, their issues. Their at your age, why don't you offer yourself for leadership? We will not discriminate you for profession as you are trying to do with me. Just because we serve the army, we must be denied the capacity to participate in leadership. Why? But said and done. Where were we coming from? We had wasted the whole 22 years. The economy was down. This uh, place where you are doing miracles with this uh, beautiful, impressive technology and beautiful scenery, you know what it was doing. Why do people want to behave like they did not know what happened? In your own case, maybe it's forgivable. I don't want to estimate your age. But many other examiners know what we went through. Could it be we that those who probably want to stand we are general are worried right? by statements like those by General Tinye that in 2006 elections were rigged and all, and the competent people that you keep calling out on to stand so that there is an alternative, they are timorous. President Museveni, General Museveni has said time and again that one cannot hand over power to wolves and all. Those statements, do you think they are palatable to those that you are calling out to How stand? easy was it to throw out Dr. Bote? How easy was it throughout Idi Amin? Some people have got the skill, capacity, and competence to change situations. Should we go to the booth too? You That's don't what have you're calling to. On the situations to have completely changed. You don't have to. Offer yourself for leadership. Isn't uh, Dr. Vesje picking some crowds? Is Antonio Mbaz picking some crowds? Our this is that you're saying. Dr. Atinyapuna said his election was rigged. Well, and the uh, court did say there were irregularities too. Well, uh, Tinyafuza still lives. Let him substantiate his statements. Was he a participant in the rigging? If so, which role was he playing? He, people should be asked to answer questions that, that they attribute their ideas to. I am not supposed to answer on behalf of General Tinyafuza. The but courts what of law said so. You're a lawyer. Yes, but you know what else they said? Irregularities in an election is always there. It's a must. Even in the American elections, you know what happened in Florida? There was alleged rigging. Alleged, I must say, alleged rigging by one of the presidential candidates. I mean, somebody was offering him for the, himself for the leadership of the Republican. But these are allegations, we don't have facts. That simply states that even in a more sophisticated, polished and equipped country like the United States, such allegations come up. Does that stop people from offering themselves for leadership? I want to tell you that some of these, uh, you know, endeavors 
are not for the meek. You need to come out firmly. And I can, I can tell you, Uganda has every hope in this direction. What we saw in 2001, what we are seeing today, this is a very peaceful election. Don't you agree with me? You're only worried about landing helicopters. You know very well what it could have been before. So, everything is getting better. So, if you are worried about the rough-edged elections, now this is a living example that in three weeks, nothing, to time, nothing is, 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 is anything to write for in a newspaper or raised in a TV. Well, there TV have been uh, some incidents here, incidents here and there in Tungamo and the like, but uh, like you say, we hope it keeps peaceful. And uh, I can also tell you that uh, when you are the, the same, you know, commenting on Ugandan matters, look by the neighborhood, look by the general spectrum of things. You know very well we are doing very well. So anyone who is fearing to offer himself because of the rough age, then it's, it's no longer very applicable. If it was ever that applicable in this country, my own view is that there is a bit of sacrifice when you want to lead the country. And the other view is that should you want to have things better, it is because you come up and speak for them and fight against the wrong elements of that, that then you may straighten and uh, you know, level the ground, as you always want to put it. All right. It's yes. a battle. Mm. Yes. All right. Lieutenant General it's not a Christmas party. Thanks for talking to us this evening. Pleasure and... Uh, Thank you for your fair questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that was Newsnight. NTV Tonight takes a quick break. We'll be right back.